Hello and welcome to this PowerShell.org tech session entitled, The Dollar Sign Isn't Part of the Variable Name. My name is Tim Warner and I'll be your trainer. I'm a regular video contributor to PowerShell.org. What we're doing in this video series is working through the free ebook, The Big Book of PowerShell Gotchas. I have a short URL down at the bottom of this slide that you can use to get to this page. And within The Big Book of PowerShell Gotchas, today we're doing item 15, dollar sign isn't part of the variable name. Before we get into the code, I want to explain a term for you, and this term is called sigil. It's the dollar sign that you and I are both familiar with in working with Windows PowerShell. The word sigil comes from the Latin word sigillum that stands for little sign. And as it happens, this sigil or this symbol in the context of computer programming is attached normally prepended to the variable name. And in many programming and scripting languages, shell scripting languages, Perl, etc., the sigil will denote the data type and the scope of a variable. However, this isn't the case with Windows PowerShell because, as you probably know, Windows PowerShell is a dynamically typed language. Let's get into the code and sort all this confusion out. Okay, the name of our script today is $PS1, and if you've watched any of my previous tech session videos, you know the drill. The script starts with a brief section on setting up the environment, and I always reveal the PowerShell version that I'm using so you can compare it against what's on your system. In the first part of the script, we're starting off pretty simple. On line 25, we're defining a variable called example. By the way, in order to run code selectively in the Windows PowerShell ISE, you can just simply place your cursor anywhere in the line and then either press F8 or use the run selection button on the toolbar. Some people have the idea that you have to come into the gutter area and highlight the entire line. That's not strictly speaking the truth. So at this point, we see that the sigil dollar sign is in action here, and we've defined a variable called example. The gotcha or the confusion is that you might think that this entire token, dollar example, represents the variable. And sure enough, if we want to reference the variable's value, we can reference dollar example, and it comes back with five as expected. But the gotcha here, the confusion, is that the dollar sign is simply the sigil and not part of the variable name. And we can prove that by running get variable. And I have a little inline comment to remind me to use IntelliSense that's built into the PowerShell ISE. And in the drop down list, this is pulling back all of the system variables and user created variables that exist in this run space. We can scroll down to the ease and we see example here. No dollar sign, just the word example. Okay. So if I complete that and run that script, it tells us that the name is example, the value is five. Okay, so really the long story short, the take home message is that the dollar token in Windows PowerShell is essentially a resolver. It means resolve the variable to any data that's stored within it. And you can actually do a lot with the dollar sigil. It's beyond our scope today to get into this. So look on line 34. I have a short URL that points to a web resource that you might find interesting. Now let's take this to the next level. What if we use the new variable commandlet to define a variable named dollar example, but this time we give it a different value? Remember that dollar example right now has a value of five. Let's select this line and run it. It appears to have worked just fine, but now if we select dollar example and try to bring back its results, look what happened, five. Do you see what's going on here in line 37? Let's come back and expand our IntelliSense list here and come down and we see example, that's to be expected. Let's select that actually. So it still says the example variable has a value of five, but then look here, there's a variable called five in our run space. And if we run that, it tells us that the name of the variable is five and its associated value is six. So do you see what happened here? The bottom line is, and this again is a really good take home message. In fact, let me adjust my screen so we can see line 37, not line 35 is that this expression here says create a variable named five, which is the contents of our example variable. You see what I mean? And assign it the value of six. There you go. And sure enough, if we select on line 46, $5, it tells us that the value of that is six. 
If we specifically want to take the value of one variable and populate it into another one, we can do that. Look at line 48. Here we're creating a variable named 5 and giving it the value of dollar $example. So let's run this line. I'll CLS to clear the screen. And sure enough, we have a variable called 5, and it's pulling its value from the example variable. There you go. Another idea is double quotes. You know that with double quotes, we're instructing the PowerShell parser to perform what's called string interpolation. When you have stuff in quotes, it's assumed that you're dealing with string data most of the time. And double quotes will take any referenced variables and expand their value. So if we double quote our example variable, Again, that's just a quick way to bring back its stored data. There's quite a few variable-related commands here. You see we can remove all of the user-created variables from our run space by running remove variable with name star. And don't worry, you're not going to clobber any system variables. Those are normally set to read-only anyway. So if you want to dump all of the variables that you've defined and not see a bunch of red error text saying you're trying to remove a read-only field, you can use error action silently continue to refresh your environment. And speaking of that, let me clear the screen and do a get command where the noun portion is variable. And we can get a quick list of all of the variable related commandlets that are built into the PowerShell core engine. The second example, let me adjust the screen so we see just this code, and I'll back off the zoom a bit as well. I create a simple function called test variable that has a single parameter that uses the string data type. Remember I mentioned that PowerShell variables are normally dynamically typed. In other words, the PowerShell parser takes what the variable's value is and decides on a data type based on what it is. You see, if you use a number without quotation marks, it's going to normally be stored as an integer, for instance. Instance, but we can use what are called type accelerators to specifically tell PowerShell which data type to assign to each variable. And here we're using the array designation, so we can run test variable against more than one computer name. In our for each loop here, we're going to iterate through that input array of computer names and just run a simple WMI query. You see in the try block here, we're defining what's called a hash table or an associative key value pair array. And speaking of which you'll notice that the at sign is another example of a popular sigil not only in Windows PowerShell but in many other shell scripting and programming languages as well. We don't need to get into the specifics of what this does other than I want you to see here on line 71 and 72 we're defining an error action and an error variable. These are what are called common parameters that are available in any function you write. And this means basically if we try this get WMI object and we run into a problem, stop execution and store the exception information or the error information in a variable. And you'll notice that I'm reasonably using $x to store that error information. You'll notice that we can use something called splatting to pass a hash table of different key value pairs into the get WMI object commandlet. That's beyond our scope. No need to worry about it. But just in case for further research you want to learn more about it, look up PowerShell splatting. We want to see furthermore and finally here we have a catch block that says if we run into a problem up here we're going to stop execution and store the variable information and then we're simply going to write that out using the warning output stream saying the error was and then we're using the variable. Again double quotes string interpolation. Sound good? Well, let's, again, I'm using the control key and the mouse scroll wheel to bring my zoom out. Let me load this function into our run space by selecting it. And now let's come down and test this thing out. Let's clear the screen down below and we'll run on line 82 test variable against the local host. And that comes back with no problem. It didn't error out because the local host is the local machine. But watch this. I'm going to do another CLS and we're going to run this against a fictitious server that does not exist. So we can expect that we're going to see an exception. It's going to bail out and print. Uh-oh, what did it do? It printed the warning text, but it didn't give us any specific error. What the heck do you think is going on here? Well, I'll tell you, the problem is on line 72. We don't want the dollar sign here. We just want to use a variable name. And normally variable names are strings. So I'm going to surround that X in single quotes. That's the problem. Once again, I'll highlight those lines and run it to bring the function back into our run space. And now if we run line 84, it's going to pause a minute and then we get an exception. Warning. 
the error was, and then here it is. So it successfully gave us the results. And the key there in this example was remembering that when we define a variable programmatically this way, we don't need the dollar sign. We just need the variable name. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this presentation. You can download the script I used at my website, timwarnertech.com forward slash dollar sign dot zip. The videos are at youtube.com forward slash PowerShell org. The community site is PowerShell.org. And if you have any questions for me, feel free to reach me via email at timothy-warner at pluralsite.com. Alternatively, you can find me at Twitter. I'm Tech Trainer Tim or through LinkedIn. Take good care.